Good morning, everybody. Welcome to another edition of Lab 207 Webcast. My name is Mr. Kite, and I'll be hanging out with you today as we wrap up our series on air. Final topic to talk about is going to be the consequences of global warming. So, as always, let me get you some objectives. I won't get going. By the end of this video, you should be able to describe multiple consequences of global warming and discuss the Kyoto Protocol. As we've talked about so far in environmental science, all actions have consequences. You have got systems that have inputs and outputs, and when you change those inputs and output, <laughs> when you change those inputs, the outputs become different. And our Earth is a finely tuned system, and finely tuned systems, when they are disrupted, there are consequences of that disruption and the system changes. The remainder of this video is just going to be a long laundry list of the consequences of global warming. All of the things I'm going to be talking about are things that we are presently seeing and observing. It's not like these are big lofty doomsday, these could happen scenarios. These are things that we have actually been able to observe and measure. So I'm going to go ahead and go through those. Then we'll talk about the Kyoto Protocol and that'll be it first consequence of global warming that I want to get to. Man, I'm sad that that's a grainy picture. It was a really pretty one. Anyway, the consequence of global warming that you hear people talk about all the time is the melting of the ice caps. Now, we've seen that since the 1880s, Arctic regions have warmed anywhere between 1 and 7 degrees, and it is predicted that between now and the end of the 21st century, so the year 2100, those areas could warm another 7 to 13 degrees. Now, if you've got ice, if things are getting warmer, the ice is going to melt. So you get the ice caps melting, which can lead to positive feedback systems because all of those big old white shiny ice caps are presently reflecting heat and radiation back out to space. But as they melt and shrink backwards, they open up darkly colored water, they uncover darkly covered land, or darkly colored land. As that water and land is struck by solar radiation, it will absorb it and warm rather than reflecting that energy back out to space. So you get a positive feedback loop where melting exposes land and water that can get warmer, that land and water gets warmer, which melts more ice, which causes more land to be exposed, and so on and so on in a vicious cycle. Now, here's a graph that kind of goes with this idea, and it shows you the ice cover of the <coughs> North Ar the North Arctic, the North Pole, the Arctic regions. It shows the ice cover since 1980, and you can see that there are seasonal fluctuations where in the summer and the spring it'll melt off, then in the winter it'll refreeze, and then it'll melt and refreeze and melt and refreeze. But you can see that there is a general trend between 1980 and 2010 of the amount of ice that is present at any point in time dr decreasing dramatically. Just this past year was the first time that humans were actually able to send shippings, shipping ships, <laughs> were able to send container ships through the Arctic from one part of the world to the other. So the ice is melting enough now that new shipping lanes are opening up, which is great for humans, but it's an indicator that things are changing dramatically in Arctic regions. Next consequence I want to get to also deals with ice. It deals with glaciers. So glaciers are essentially frozen rivers of ice in mountainous areas. They flow down through the mountains according to gravity. They scour landscapes. They are ecosystems for the animals that live in that area and they have been melting very dramatically. So as glaciers melt, obviously habitat for any animals that live in that area is altered. Also, a lot of areas of the world that <clears throat> are below mountainous regions rely on those melting glaciers for their fresh water. So during the summer and the spring, the glaciers melt down a little bit, the water runs off, people are able to get that water and use it as their source of fresh water. And then historically in the winter, those glaciers would refreeze, grow to their original size, and the cycle would continue. But now that the earth is getting warmer, they are melting, which is great because it's providing a lot of fresh water, but they're not having a chance to refreeze to grow back to their original size. So over time, that resource is going to be depleted. One place in the world where this is very, very evident is Glacier National Park in America. The national park there used to have 150 glaciers, and it's now down to 25. So that seems to me to be pretty good evidence that things are actually getting warmer. Still talking about freezing and frozen things, the next consequence of global warming would be melting permafrost. Now, if you remember, permafrost is a situation that occurs in tundra areas. It is a layer of soil that is permanently frozen. Permafrost could be up to a mile deep in certain areas. 
because you've got this huge layer of organic material that is frozen, as that permafrost melts, a couple things can happen. First thing is anything that's built on top of that permafrost, the land beneath it is going to shift, so those structures could be damaged significantly. Another big problem is that as that permafrost melts, the organic material that is frozen, or at least was frozen, begins to decompose under very wet, oxygen-poor conditions, which we know decomposition under oxygen-poor conditions releases methane. As that permafrost melts, the organic material becomes available for decomposition. It decomposes, it releases methane, which becomes another positive feedback loop that actually increases the uh, speed of global warming. Sea level rising is another consequence of global warming that is talked about very frequently. Um, scientists debate and argue and try to measure how much sea levels have actually risen. We know that they are presently rising. There are island nations that are preparing to be overtaken by rising sea levels. But there are problems for people living in normal coastal areas too. People like to live by the beach. It's nice. It's beautiful. But as sea levels rise, that land is no longer habitable. Also, if you've got rising sea levels, when a storm comes along, the storm surge that is pushed ahead of it is going to cause more damage because the ocean levels are higher, so that storm surge is gonna be able to track further inland. Also, rising sea levels can cause estuaries. Remember, estuaries are a mix of salt and fresh water. As sea levels rise, the estuaries can become inundated with salt, lot, salt water, which is going to significantly alter the habitat of that region. So there are a lot of consequences of sea level rising, not just people losing places where they can build and, let, build and live and farm. Here's a quick graphic to show you what we know as far as sea level rises since 1860. So this chart goes from 1860 to the present day, and it shows that mean sea level, so that would be the average sea level over the Earth, has gone up by roughly 225 millimeters over the past 140, 150 years. So that is a pretty significant change. Uh, 20, 225 millimeters would be 22.5 centimeters, which is a little bit more than a foot or a little bit less than a foot. So that's a pretty significant change over a 150 year period. When we think about global warming, heat waves seems to be another logical consequence. And if the world is getting hotter than heat waves, which is uh, periods of intense heat, are obviously going to be more frequent and more intense. Increased heat waves can lead to increased incidence of drought, can lead to crop damage. Obviously, it's also going to lead to an increased demand for electricity for cooling, which is another feedback loop where you're using energy to cool buildings, but you're producing greenhouse gases while making that energy. Uh, heat waves can be particularly dangerous for people who don't have access to air conditioning and the elderly, so keep that in mind. Now one positive impact of global warming is fewer cold spells. Obviously, if there are fewer cold spells, then you need to use less energy for heating, so that's cool. Also, if you have got less land that is covered by ice, that means you have more, far, uh, more far, farmland opening up. And this is something that they're already seeing in Greenland and Iceland and other northern regions of Canada and Russia. Land that previously could not have been farmed because it was either frozen all the time or covered with snow much of the year is now becoming available for growing crops. So that's kind of cool because you get the ability to grow more crops, but there are also more pests. A lot of pest control relies on the fact that cold temperatures kill off pests. If the temperatures aren't as cold, then those pests that can damage crops aren't killed off like they normally would be, which means that you've got more pests that are going to eat those new crops that you are able to grow. Precipitation patterns are going to change as the world gets warmer. Obviously, a warming world is going to increase the rate of of evaporation, which puts more water up into the atmosphere. If there's more water in the atmosphere, that means there is more water to form rain and snow. So for some regions, this is good. It could have been a historically dry region that's now getting rain, which means that possibly they could do some farming that they normally wouldn't be able to do. But there's other areas of the world that already get plenty of rain, and more rain means flooding and terrible monsoons and landslides and all of the things that go along with a lot of rain. There will also be places in the world that will get less rain as the rain patterns shift around the world. The big one that a lot of people talk about is storm intensity. As we've had Hurricane Sandy last year, Hurricane Katrina several years back, scientists have argued about whether or not 
storms are becoming more frequent and more intense, logic would say that they probably are because uh, big storms, especially hurricanes, are driven by warm water in the oceans. If the water in the ocean is warming up as a consequence of global warming, then it would make sense that we are going to have more storms and the storms we have are going to be more intense because there's more heat energy in that water to fuel the storm. So simple connection, keep it in mind. And this might be the last consequence though, no, there's a couple beyond this, but ocean currents is another um, consequence of global warming that people look at as being possibly problematic. Way back, we talked about thermohaline circulation, which is an ocean current that depends on cold water being able to sink down at the poles and then drive the circulation pattern that has warm water from the equator traveling along the surface of the earth towards or surface of the ocean towards the northern regions and getting cold and sinking and traveling along the bottom and running this continuous loop around the world. If you've got polar regions getting warmer, then you are going to have less of that cold water sinking down towards the bottom of the ocean. Less water sinking means that the current isn't going to be able to run as efficiently. And the problem with this is that this thermohaline circulation current distributes heat around the world. So it takes uh, warm water from the equator and moves it up towards northern regions, keeping northern regions a more stable and warmer temperature than they would normally be. It also moves cold water down towards the equator, thus evening out temperatures around the world. So it's possible that if thermohaline circulation is shut down, that we will see more extremes in temperatures at the equator and at the poles. Now these were all like earth system consequences I talked about. Let's talk about animals, plants, and people real quick. As far as wild plants and animals are concerned, we've talked a lot about animals being adapted to particular environments. If their environment is changing, then they can either migrate and move, or if they're not able to do so and they aren't able to adapt, they will probably go extinct. So a lot of animals have the ability to migrate. So as climates change and ecosystems change, the animals will be able to migrate according to those changes. Now this is assuming that humans haven't blocked their migration routes. In some cases, humans have blocked migration routes, so animals that are trying to move in response to changing climates may not be able to do so and could possibly become extinct. Now one type of animal that doesn't have this problem is the mosquito. Mosquitoes carry tons of diseases. You got yellow fever, you got malaria, you've got West Nile virus, you've got all kinds of crazy diseases. And we've already seen that diseases carried by mosquitoes historically have been confined to the tropics, but we're now seeing them move beyond the tropics as the world becomes warmer. The mosquitoes that carry those diseases are starting to extend their range north and south of the equator, which means we're seeing malaria start to crop up in areas of the world where we have never seen it before. For humans, we've got all kinds of consequences. We've talked about coastal living. Humans like to live on coasts, so as sea levels rise and storms become more intense, that's going to negatively impact people living in coastal regions. There will be newly habitable areas as um, areas in the far north and the far south warm up and the snow melts and the frost melts. People will be able to live there. Tourism is something we don't normally think about that could be impacted, but think of this. If you are a ski resort owner, and it is not snowing as frequent, frequently and winters are warmer, you have less snow upon which people can ski, which means you need to find other ways to make money off of your mountain. Um, as far as humans are concerned, all uh, crops are going to be another thing that's gonna change as far as what's growing and when it's growing and what it takes to grow it. We talked about diseases spreading through uh, mosquitoes, lots of consequences for humans that go along with climate change. And last slide for the day. I want to talk about the Kyoto Protocol. Now the Kyoto Protocol was a response to climate change. In 1997, world leaders got together and they decided, all right, climate change is something that impacts all of us. It's not like one country can uh, form legislation for their country and protect their country from global warming. This is something that everybody contributes to and it impacts everybody. So in 1997, they got together to try to do something about global warming. The understanding that was put into place at the time is that globally, the countries of the world would reduce emissions 5.2% below the level that they were at at 1990. So they took 1990 as a baseline, and they said, as a world, we are going to get below those emissions by 5.2%. Now, these reductions were to be disproportionate. So countries that were developed and producing the most pollution were to reduce their pollution. The most developing countries, because they didn't contribute so much to the problem, restrictions were not put on them as far as redu reducing emissions go. Now, 
this caused a lot of problems because at the time the Kyoto Conference took place, countries like India and China argued that, hey, we are developing countries. You developed world, you had your chance to develop using fossil fuels, it's our turn now, so restrictions should not be placed on us. And ultimately, restrictions were not put on the emissions of China and India, and they have now become the biggest emitters of carbon dioxide in the world. So there's a lot of arguing about who needs to make reductions, who doesn't need to make reductions. Reductions could be made through efficiency, so just emitting less carbon dioxide. They could also be made through sequestration, which is finding ways to capture and hold on to carbon dioxide, mostly through the planting or preservation of forests and trees. Major thing to note is that America is the only developed country to never ratify the treaty. So all of these agreements went around the world. It's come to America several times, and each time America, for various reasons, has decided that we are not going to sign on to this treaty. Um, Al Gore and President Clinton, they did sign on to it, but the Senate never ratified it, so it's not legally, blind, legally binding in America. And then uh, President George W. Bush had the opportunity to sign on to it, and he said that the science wasn't certain enough, so he wasn't going to sign on to it. And President Ob Barack Obama has uh, sought to reduce carbon dioxide emissions, but he has never signed on to the Kyoto Protocol. So this is something that the world agreed to, but then America said, eh, we're not going to get on board with it. There have been climate conferences since, notably one in Copenhagen, and then there was another one just a couple of weeks ago. They've gotten together to try to talk about reducing emissions, but putting together another grand deal that significantly reduces um, the emission of greenhouse gases has been very difficult. So at this point, Kyoto Protocol was a success, but further follow-up conferences have mostly been a failure. And I think that's it. That wraps up our series on air. Thanks for joining us on the Lab 207 webcast. My name is Mr. Kite. Hopefully we'll see you again.